everybody. And so we're here in Matthew chapter 24. And as you're probably aware, Matthew chapter 24 is kind of a really famous end times chapter. And so the end times is kind of mentioned in three different places in the Gospels, like for full chapters. Matthew 24 is the most famous. And what we're going to do in this sermon is kind of look at some correlations between what's going on with the coronavirus and the end times, okay? Now, obviously, on Wednesdays, we're talking about the end times. We're going through the book of Revelation, and I encourage you this Wednesday to tune into the sermon. I'm going to preach on Revelation 5.5, and the purpose of that sermon is to talk about the things that must take place before Daniel's 70th week starts in Revelation chapter 6. Now, let me give you a little bit of a groundwork before I get into this sermon, because especially as we're preaching on the sermon on the coronavirus, there's a lot of different opinions out there, and I want to make sure people kind of understand where I'm coming from and my views and everything like that. Let me say this, as I'm talking about the end times, my personal view has always been the end times will not come in my lifetime. And I'm probably an exception to that. Like, I do not believe that the end times will come during my lifetime. I haven't changed my opinion, and I could be wrong, but the reason why I believe that, one, is in the book of Thessalon Thessalonians, the church of Thessalonica thought the end was coming during their, their lifetime 2,000 years ago. The reason why is because they had heavy persecution. And so they figured it must be like right around the corner. Even in Acts 1, they're, they're asking, is he coming back? They thought it was right around the corner. People have always thought that the coming was right around the corner. Okay? Obviously, we're getting closer you don't get further away from his coming back, but I personally don't think it's going to come during our lifetime. I could be wrong. The temple hasn't been built, and these are things I'll talk about in the sermon on Wednesday. A lot of things must take place. So me preaching this sermon, I'm not saying this to say, man, Jesus is going to come back now. Don't buy a house. Don't buy a car. Don't worry about raising your kids because it doesn't even matter. You know, just go soul winning 24-7 because I don't believe it's going to come during our lifetime. I believe we have decades left at least to serve God and I could be wrong. But look, the Black Plague happened. The Spanish flu. Lots of people died before. It's not like this is completely brand new. There's always been pestilences in this world. Malaria is killing a lot of people today. Not really here, but in Africa, lots of people die from malaria. So I'm not preaching this sermon to try to scare you into thinking, man, Jesus is going to come. This is the beginning of sorrows. Because I personally don't believe it is. Okay, now I could be wrong. You could have a different opinion. That's fine. One thing I'll say about this is, I think it's important when it comes to what we're preaching and other churches preach that we don't stand in judgment against some other church that has a different opinion right. or is doing things differently. And there's many reasons for this. One, we're not in the same situation. Okay, now we're in the Philippines, a completely different country, and part of my perspective on why we're doing things the way we are is honestly the coronavirus is nowhere near as bad here as the United States of America. Okay, I'm not saying it's not dangerous because we're putting in precautions, but no doubt if you've paid any attention at all, it's Europe and the United States that is getting decimated. Okay, and there's different opinions on why that is. But it's happening a lot more over there. We're not in the same situation as churches in the U.S. And the United States is a big country, over 300 million people. When we moved to Sacramento, California, it was like a 42-hour drive across the country. And I was driving probably way over the speed limit to try to save time, okay? So some areas of the U.S., they're, my home country, my home state, West Virginia, some of you guys saw that video I posted a while ago because that was the last state with a coronavirus case. And there, because West Virginia is a country area. They're not, it's not this big, you know, packed in city or, you know, really dirty place where that's happening. So it hasn't been at, it hasn't had as big of an effect there as other places. So some churches might be making decisions because their area is a lot different than other places. Right. But if you have a church in New York City right now, man, good night. You better be on your knees praying a lot because over half the cases last I saw in the U.S. are happening in either New York or New Jersey, which is less than 10% of the population of the U.S. And if you're familiar with the geography, that's essentially the same state on the border. The New York sports teams, they have their stadium in New Jersey most of the time. So it's basically the same area is getting decimated. And there's a chance that could come to other big cities across the nation. We're not really sure. But depending on where you live, it's going to affect things, okay? Other things to keep in mind, there's honestly just a lot of different opinions on what's going on. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of confusions. Some people are going to tell you one billion people are dying. Some people are going to say one million. That's a big difference, okay? And how you handle things is going to be largely based on how big of a thing do you think this is. 
Some people that think this is just the flu, probably they're not gonna have any precautions. But if you think this is a big virus and lots of people are gonna die, obviously you're gonna have more precautions, okay? There's a lot of unknowns in the case fatality rate. Some people are saying it's overestimated and some reports are saying it's underestimated. Okay, so it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert at all this stuff. I know in Europe, the case fatality rate is over 10% for a lot of countries. And in other areas, it's really low. And it's like, you know, who really knows about all this stuff? There's so many unknowns and confusion out there, which I believe is part of the devil's plan. And so how churches are handling things is going to be based on their different understanding. And look, I could be wrong on my understanding. Obviously, you know, you all probably know that a couple weeks ago, I kind of put out my opinion that a lot of people are dying. And it's basically trending that direction with the math. But if this kind of fizzles out starting tomorrow, then I'd be basically wrong about that. But if 6,000 people are dying daily right now, if that lasts for a year, that's over 2 million dead. But if this spreads to more countries and they're not doing the quarantining, it could be like 20,000 dead in a day. You know, we really just don't know. There's a lot of unknowns. So let me say this, that people have different opinions and that's fine. But I want to show you some correlations with the end times, okay? Just three basic points here. And the first point is this, that during the end times, like now, there are going to be dangers. There are going to be dangers. I believe this is a real virus. I believe it's dangerous. And guess what? During the end times, there's going to be dangers. Notice Matthew 24, verse 6. Matthew 24, verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 6, ye shall hear of wars. Now, the wars are real. The rumors of wars, they might not be real. Do you understand what I'm saying? The rumors of wars might be like, hey, the U.S. and Iran might go to war. Okay, something like that. But the wars in this verse are real wars. Okay, that implies there's going to be danger involved if there's wars going on. Now, as a country... Although we threaten other countries to go to war from time to time, generally the Philippines isn't involved in a whole lot of wars, okay? Probably the Arab countries and the U.S. and Israel are going to be at the heart of those battles. Maybe we'll escape it. We don't know. I think during the end times, though, pretty much every country is going to be drawn into making a decision of what side they're going on. And there are going to be wars, which guess what? That's dangerous. People are dying when wars happen. So we see that there are wars. Notice what it says. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And so these things will take place. As much as they try to avoid countries having nuclear weapons, they try to just get at peace with one another, look, the end is going to come, there's going to be wars, there's going to be rumors of wars, countries will fight against countries, and guess what? That's dangerous. This is the beginning of sorrows. This is the first four seals of Revelation. This is the first three and a half years before the abomination of desolation takes place. Okay. Now, as I'm going to mention on Wednesday, before we get to Daniel's 70th week, I believe that we're going to progress towards the point when the beginning of sorrows takes place. Okay. We're going to have more likelihood of going to war and things such as that. And we're going to have this one world system and things such as that. But what I want you to understand is when the beginning of sorrows happens, when we're in Daniel's 70th week, even before the abomination of desolation, halfway through, there will be wars. And the Bible says, see that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass. It's going to happen. It can't be avoided, but the end is not yet. Notice what it says in verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. You say, Brother Stucky, I don't believe the Philippines will be at war. I think we're going to avoid that. Okay, well, notice what it says after that. And there shall be famines and pestilences. Okay, pestilence, kind of like the coronavirus. You're seeing kind of a link there. Okay, dangers today, dangers during the end times. There's going to be pestilences, plural. Which is part of why I'm not really that concerned of Jesus coming back in the next five years. Because pestilences is plural. Okay, this is one major pestilence we're talking about. But there's going to be pestilences. And you know what? As much as wars kill people, you know about World War I, what a big war that was. But guess what happened right after World War I? The Spanish flu. And guess what killed a whole lot more people than World War I? The Spanish flu. Pestilences will kill more people probably than the wars. 
We get so concerned with the wars, but honestly, a little virus ends up killing lots of people. And quite honestly, as much as governments try to stop it from happening, especially if it's the judgment of God, look, it's going to go out there. And you can try to stop it. And I'm not saying those things don't help. I'm not saying I'm completely against quarantining areas. We'll talk about that later. But here's what I'm saying. You know what? A virus is not easy to just kind of hold in place, okay? It's going to eventually spread, especially the world we live in, where people are flying all over the place and visiting places. People here in Manila, they go home to their province and they bring the virus there probably. That stuff actually takes place, okay? And so a pestilence will probably kill a lot more people than the wars, okay? There will be dangers during the end times. You say, but Brother Stuckey, we are not going to be involved in wars, and we're a warm country, so we'll probably avoid most of the pestilence. Now, I would say in general, I would agree that warmer countries are not as affected by the coronavirus and other viruses. If you look at the countries that are being decimated, you look at the ones that are at the top, they're cold countries on average. I looked at it. I looked at the, the 191 countries on the list I saw on a website and I looked at average temperature. And you know what? There's like over half the countries in the world are like very warm all the time. It's not just the Philippines, okay? The countries that are majorly affected, they're generally cold countries. And even in the areas where the coronavirus is hitting in those countries, it's generally hitting big cities, lots of pollution, colder areas, okay? There's specific kind of areas. So I do believe us being in a warmer country is definitely helping us. Man, bring on the heat in April and May and June, right? I mean, hey, if it hits 50 degrees, amen, right? <laughs> it's like bring on the heat and I do believe that will help kill the coronavirus to a large degree because viruses do survive more during the cold temperatures. Growing up in West Virginia, I got sick one time every year and it was always during the winter time because in West Virginia, look, it gets well below zero degrees Celsius every single year. It's cold, okay? It gets down to like, I don't know, negative 20, negative 30 degrees every single year. And during that time, you know what? When you're outside, it's very easy to get sick. Not at all areas of the U.S. have cold weather, like winter weather. Like San Diego and places like that, they're pretty much always warm. They're always a paradise. But some areas, like where I grew up, it's cold all the time. There's lots of snow on the ground. And guess what? Viruses affect you more during that time period. But I want you to see something. After pestilences, notice what it says. And earthquakes in diverse places. Now let me ask you, do we get affected by earthquakes? Yes, we do. Look, I had never experienced an earthquake in my life until last year. You say, why? Because there's nothing in West Virginia. You're not going to have an earthquake in West Virginia. What they consider an earthquake is like 2.1. It's like, man, we had an earthquake today. Something where it's like you didn't even notice it happened. Okay? Earthquakes do affect the Philippines. Okay? So some countries that are avoiding basically, you know, the pestilences to a large degree, they're going to be majorly affected by the earthquakes. I heard an interesting thought recently in a sermon, and, you know, I think it makes a lot of sense. This is the beginning of sorrows during the end, and people are dying due to wars and pestilences. And when people die and go to hell, the Bible says, hell hath enlarged herself. And earthquakes take place due to basically, I guess, the movement of the tectonic plates underneath the earth. I'm not an expert at earthquakes. You know, maybe I'm saying stuff wrong. But hell enlarging herself could cause some earthquakes, okay? But what I'm telling you is this, we're probably gonna experience some of those earthquakes. And so we might avoid the major wars because we're not, you know, an Arab country or Europe or the US. We're not gonna avoid everything during the beginning of sorrows though. There is gonna be persecution. There are gonna be dangers like there are today. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. So look, I'm not in fear here this morning because quite honestly, I don't, I don't want the Lord to come back during my lifetime because I want to see my kids grow up and have families and serve God and for them to have kids that they teach to be soul winners. I don't want it to come during my lifetime. I want to be able to go soul winning until I'm 90 years old. And if I, I don't have the ability to go out there door to door in parks, I want to just be, I don't know, calling up people or whatever messaging them on Facebook, trying to give them the gospel or whatever. I don't know. I want to be a soul winner until the day I die and serve God. 
So I don't want the Lord to come back during my lifetime, but it is possible. It will happen. But I personally, I don't think it will happen. Okay, I think there's a lot of things that, that need to take place, but we do see correlations from what we have today with what we have during the end times. Realize this though, during the Spanish Inquisition, when the Catholic Church was murdering 50 million people, there was correlations during that time period with the end times also. Okay, during the Black Plague, there was correlations then with what's going on in the end times, okay? But I'm just showing you this major situation. We do have correlations that we can see things, and I've learned some stuff from this coronavirus. I, it's given me a better understanding of the end times, and we'll see this later on. But notice 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. The church of Thessalonica was a very godly church. Okay? This is the reason why when you're reading 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, those books are focusing on the end times, which is more the meat of the word. The deeper things. Why? They're not the church of Galatia that's confused on salvation. They're not the church of Corinth where there's just this open sin that's not being dealt with. They were more dedicated. And so in the book of Thessalonians, first and second, it focuses on the end times. And they could understand it because in verse 4, they are dealing with persecutions and tribulations. The result of this was they thought the end might come in our lifetime. Because we've got major tribulations. The Roman Empire was just decimating and killing the Christians. Okay? But then you go to chapter 2, and the Bible's very clear. Don't be deceived. That day is not going to come except the man of sin be revealed. We really do not know for the in the end times until the man of sin reveals himself. The abomination of desolation. Until that point, we're just guessing. That's why I, I don't think it will come in our life because it's been 2,000 years and people have always thought it would come. Once the abomination of desolation takes place, that's the mark where we know, okay, we're in the end times. We only got a short time left. Just go soul winning, serve God, and then you either, you know, you die, you get, you, you die, you get martyred, or you just go down swinging and get raptured, okay, if you last through because it's only a short time left, okay? But in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 4, they dealt with persecutions and tribulations. And look, they were dealing with dangers as well. Turn to Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. Quite honestly, though, when it comes to being a Christian, there have always been dangers when you serve God. See, around the world, there's been areas of just peace and not really much pestilence and prosperity and things are great. But when you serve God, there's always at least a little bit of danger. You say, why? Because the world hates us. They hate our message. They hate what we do. And we live in a time period and in a country where we do not get persecuted for going soul winning. But look, if you lived in North Korea, if you lived in a Muslim country, you know what? You're at danger every single week of your life that somebody turns you in for being a Christian, right? You could get killed for preaching the gospel. We are blessed. We don't have to worry about that so much. We're experiencing a little bit of danger, but quite honestly, around the world, people that actually serve God, they're getting tortured to death today around the world. Okay? And so I want you to understand that when it comes to serving God, there's always at least a little bit of a danger as a Christian because the world hates our message. Proverbs 21, verse 31. You say, Brother Stucky, does that make you afraid? Well, notice what it says in Proverbs 21, verse 31. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Now notice, the horse does prepare. So I'm not saying it's foolish to prepare. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but at the end of the day, safety is of the Lord. And when you're serving God, if God allows you to die as a martyr like Stephen, that was God's choice. Okay, God allows something tragic to happen for whatever reason God allowed that to happen. But if you're serving God, hey, safety's of the Lord. Amen. I do not have concerns when I'm trying to serve God. When I was moving here, there were a lot of people that tried to tell me not to move here. Okay, and it kind of surprised me because even Christians were telling me, no, you shouldn't go to the Philippines. And the big argument was it's dangerous. It's dangerous in the Philippines. And I'm, for, for one, I'm not really concerned. It's not like I was saying I'm going to North Korea to be a missionary. <laughs> it's like, but I, they were saying it's so dangerous in the Philippines. They're so worried, like you get off the, the plane and some Muslim's going to cut off your head right when you land. I'm thinking there's not really that many Muslims in the Philippines. I mean, there are some, but it's, it's not like it's, it's, it's Iraq. 
It's like it's not like I'm going to die from day one. It's like they're putting me in fear of coming here. It's so dangerous and everything like that. And it's like even recently, because we have lots of family that have tried to get us to come home to the U.S. And you know, one of the big arguments, especially those that are from the Philippines, is it's just really dangerous in the Philippines. You got to come home now. It's like of any time to try to suggest someone to come to the U.S. due to danger, like you pick now. It's like the U.S. has more cases of coronavirus than any two countries put together. If there was any any time where I'd feel dangerous going back to the U.S., it would be now. You know, but quite honestly, if you're serving God. I don't think you really have to fear. Amen. Safety is of the Lord. We prepare ourselves. We have precautions. We have precautions right now as a church. But at the end of the day, safety is of the Lord. Okay? Now, turn in your Bible back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So number one, there are going to be dangers during the end times. And one thing this coronavirus has, has taught us, if you've seen, paid any attention to social media, is 99% of people live their lives in fear. They are afraid of everything. They are, I mean, just normal people, they're just so scared. It's like, quit watching the news. Right. If the news makes you this afraid, turn it off. They're so scared to even step outside of their house. And look, I'm not saying we shouldn't have precautions, but it's like, it's one thing after another. It's like, wow, there's an earthquake. Man, they're so afraid. An earthquake happened in the Philippines, or the volcano exploded, right? And now it's the coronavirus. It's going to be something else six months from now. It's like people live their lives in fear. God hath not given us, save people, the spirit of fear. And if you're living your life afraid of everything that could go wrong, that's not coming from God. That's coming from the world. Look, dangers will always exist, especially when you serve God. But safety is of the Lord, okay? I don't find myself. I've followed what's going on in the coronavirus. I like math. I've looked at the math. I've tried to make projections, but I'm not afraid of what's taking place. Right. And you know, most people, the average person out there, they're living their lives just scared to death of what could go wrong. When if you're a saved person, safety is of the Lord. That's what the Bible Amen. teaches. Now when it comes to dangers, most, most people in the world, that's their biggest concern about this whole situation. But I'll tell you something that's worse than dangers as a believer. Not dangers, but difficulties. Difficulties are worse for us than dangers because safety is of the Lord. Okay, and so basically, yes, it's a dangerous situation, but I trust in God to protect us. But look, this situation has caused a lot of difficulties with serving God, difficulties with coming to church, difficulties with going soul winning, difficulties with getting groceries. You go to the grocery store, you're going to spend three hours. That's how long I spend. And the grocery store is right beside my house. Three hours later, I come home because you're outside in the sun for an hour and a half just to get in the grocery store. Kills off the coronavirus, though. It's like, amen, right? But it, there's difficulties just doing your daily things. And guess what? During the end times, it's not just that people are dying during the beginning of sorrows. If I've learned anything from this coronavirus, what I've learned is there will be a lot of difficulties just in your daily, everyday stuff during the end times. Okay? Notice what it says in Matthew 24, verse 7. And there shall be famines and pestilences. There shall be famines and pestilences. Look, I can tell you why the famines will probably take place. It's probably due to the pestilences. The wars and pestilences will ca probably cause the famines. You say, why? Because when you have a pestilence and nobody's working, guess what? We're not trusting in manna falling down from heaven for us. There's going to be famines because people aren't working and they don't have food. The pestilences will probably cause the famines. That's what's going to take place. And what you're going to see around the world is we're probably going to start to see famines take place, especially if lockdowns are extended for months and months. And look, if you've listened to some of the reports of people and what they're saying, some of them are saying, you know, that I, I think it was the famous doctor that's out there. I can't remember his name, Dr. Fauci or something like that. He said he doesn't even expect, it might have been someone else, but one of the doctors said he doesn't expect it to end this year. He expects it to be uh, next year will go on again. It will never end. It will just bounce around until we get that vaccine to fix everything. That's what they're saying, isn't it? Right. They're saying this is just going to be continually a virus every single year. And it's like, man, if it's going to be here every single year, then I guess it's just going to be here every single year. It's like, I guess we better get our immune systems up and be healthier and trust in the Lord then, okay? Amen. Because we can't spend hundreds and hundreds of years just on lockdown, okay? Eventually, you got to go back to work. Now, look, different areas are in different situations, but I want you to understand a few things. And I thought about this example last night. When I was in the U.S. in 1994, 
there was a famous event where I lived called the blizzard of 94. Now, blizzard means there's a lot of snow in case you're not aware, because I know here there's no snow, so maybe you're not sure. The blizzard of 94, there's just a lot of snow. And when I say a lot of snow, I mean four feet of snow plus. It was to my head. Look, and this happened in like two days, there's four feet of snow on the ground. Guess what happens when four feet of snow falls on the ground? Nobody can work. Everything was shut down in West Virginia for weeks on end. You say, why? Because if you've ever tried driving in the snow before, man, good night, it's scary. You try driving on the ice, you can't go anywhere with your car. Like we lived on a really steep hill, you know, I lived in the mountain state, West Virginia, and there was all the cars that were stuck at the bottom of the hill and people would walk up and it would take like 30 minutes to walk up to the house and 30 minutes to walk down just to go to the gas station to get some very basic stuff. They had all the, the snow equipment out there, they were salting the road and doing everything they could to get rid of it because nothing could happen for weeks. Now as a nine year old kid, I was like, this is awesome. It's like, man, I, got school. I don't have school right now. This is great. We're just playing backyard football. And I remember we played backyard football and pretty much you couldn't move because it was like up to here in my chest. You're like this. So the tallest person was like unstoppable. They're just like moving through and I'm just like trying to move in the snow. It was great as a kid, but I want you to understand something. West Virginia was completely shut down. But did you know there was areas of the United States where it was 30 plus degrees outside? 30 plus degrees Celsius. You realize you don't have to shut down San Diego because there's a massive blizzard in West Virginia. Why? There's no snow in San Diego, okay? My opinion as I've looked at the statistics here with the coronavirus, and this is the problem with governments in general, but what I believe the US should do, because the US is a good template because they have the most statistics, the, the, the mayor of the local area should report to the governor or senators about this is what's going on in our area of the state, report to the governor or senator, and then they report to the president, okay? Because there are areas of the US, like where my parents live, and there's no coronavirus really. Because it's a local town where it's not polluted and it's not crowded. And what you're seeing is the big cities where it's polluted and crowded, that's where they have the big outbreak. I don't think they should just quarantine the whole nation. I think they should look at the areas where there's a big outbreak and quarantine those areas instead of just nationwide making a decision. And look, I believe it's better to be handled in a local area where people are aware of what's going on in that area. Okay, this is my opinion. You might disagree and that's fine. But what I've seen on the statistics is there's certain areas of the US, they don't really have much of an issue right now. And I don't think it's wise to just quarantine the entire nation and shut off all work. But I want you to understand something. What this situation has taught me is during the end times when there's pestilences, guess what's gonna happen? They're gonna quarantine whole nations. See, I didn't realize this a couple weeks ago. And all of a sudden I was like, man, the book of Revelation is really opening up. Matthew 24 is opening up. Because when it says pestilences here, guess what this has taught me? There's gonna be quarantining. I didn't realize that several weeks ago. But now I realize that's probably what's gonna take place. And when there's quarantining, guess what happens? There's difficulties. Isn't that true? During the end times, there are going to be pestilences. And quite honestly, those pestilences are probably going to be worse than the coronavirus. And it's going to cause mass quarantining. There's going to be famines because people aren't working. They can't get to the grocery stores to get food. They're trusting in the government to provide food. Not all governments are going to be able to do it. There's going to be a lot of difficulties, not just serving God, but just doing your basic daily and weekly routine. That is what's going to take place during the end times. So guess what? I see a lot of cor correlations between what's happening now and what's going to happen during the end times. Turn to Revelation 6. Revelation 6. Revelation chapter 6. So what you see with a lot of countries around the world is they're trying to basically fit everything into this communist regime. Basically where you completely rely on the government and the government provides your needs. Okay, and that's a wrong philosophy, that's unbiblical, and it's happened throughout history. In those societies, they always just slaughter tons of people. Pol Pot killed one-third of Cambodia. The Cambodia, Cambodian killing fields is what that was known as. One-third of the population almost was slaughtered to death by that communist regime. You look at Russia, and Russia killed tens of millions of people in the gulags. There's that famous book, The Gulag Archipelago, where someone had escaped it and he wrote about what took place. And whenever you look at communist nations, guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna kill a lot of people. And look, we've seen that joke about North Korea with that meme, but I believe it's reality. Someone gets the coronavirus, they're probably getting shot to death. 
that's probably how they deal with not spreading the virus. I believe that's probably what's taking place in North Korea. That's why they, they probably don't have any cases. Because everyone who gets the case is either in hiding and, and won't admit it to the public, or they're getting killed by the communist regime. That is what takes place, okay? Revelation 6, verse 5. Revelation 6, verse 5. The governments want you to have to fully rely on them for survival. And it's going to get more and more to that point as we get towards the end times. Revelation 6 verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Balances are used to weigh something. Okay. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. And so notice it says a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Now, if you're an American, you might say, man, that's not much. A penny is like two pesos. That's not so bad. But in the Bible, if you look up penny, a penny was a day's wage of work. Okay? They hire laborers in the field and they earn one penny a day. So basically, 8 to 12 hours out there in the sun, you're given one penny. So basically, you get a small measure of wheat for a whole day of work. Why? Because it's supply and demand. If they don't have any food and lots of people want it, guess what? Prices will be sky high. And this is what's going to take place. You see prices are going all over the place. The gas prices are plummeting. They're dropping. Why? Because people aren't driving. They don't need gas right now. But you know what? Food, once it becomes scarce and there's famines, guess what? The prices are going to go through the roof. Why? Because people need it and there's not much of it. That's what's going to take place during the end times. A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Then it says, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Why does it say hurt not the oil and the wine? Because oil and wine are very expensive, precious, and rare commodities. Hurt not. Okay, it's very valuable. Turn to Genesis 49. Genesis 49. And so look, I think the difficulties are worse than the dangers. Because honestly, when you're living for God, you do not live your life in fear all the time. I don't find myself waking up every morning saying, oh man, I don't know if I'm going to make it another day. Okay. Now there have been viruses in the past where if I lived during the Black Plague, man, I probably would have some fear. Even though God hath not given us a spirit of fear, it's like, man, the Black Plague killed one third of Europe. I think I'd be really worried for friends, family, myself. I could see that. The Spanish flu, I watched a documentary, they say somebody would be like 30 years old in the prime of their life and the Sp they'd get hit with the Spanish flu and 12 hours later they were dead. I mean, somebody could be in really good shape, just 30 years old, no health problems, they get the Spanish flu, 12 hours later they're dead. Now look, as far as we know, although the coronavirus I think is very real, it's, it's not that. Like people aren't dying in 12 hours and killing somebody that's in the prime of their life. As far as we know, at least right now, that's not taking place. One thing I would say though is, I've heard them say that the more you're exposed to the coronavirus, it actually becomes more deadly with time. I don't fully understand how that works because it's not like that with other viruses, but if it was made by the government, then who knows, right? I don't really know. There's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. But at this point, it's not like that, but I just want you to realize that you know what, there are viruses that have been that deadly before. And maybe I would have a fear in that situation. In this situation, look, as a Christian, I don't think you have a reason to be afraid. Amen. Okay, Genesis 49, verse 22. Genesis 49, verse 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow, fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well. Now, Joseph, as is in Genesis chapter 49, it's going to list the 12 sons of Jacob, and it's going to kind of give descriptions about what they're going to be like down the road. Not them themselves, but basically their lineage, okay? Dan is called like a serpent. Dan wasn't even included in the book of Revelation because he was very wicked. He lost his place, okay? And so Joseph, though, was looked at as very godly. And it says something very positive about him. Then it says, whose branches run over the wall whose branches run over the wall. If you've ever seen this in person or a picture of this, let's say you have a tall wall that's like 20 feet high. I'm not gonna be able to climb a wall that's 20 feet high, right? If there's nothing to grab onto, you're not gonna be able to climb it. But you'll see vines or branches that are just connected to the wall and they kind of are just over it, okay? Somehow, this is kind of the picture it's giving you. In Sacramento, you know, we had a tree in our backyard and you know, I liked the tree, I thought it was beautiful until I actually lived there because the branches would go over the fence to my neighbor's house. 
which means I'm responsible for cutting them. And you have to pay someone to cut them, and I'm pretty cheap, so I just climbed up in the tree with a machete, and I was holding onto a branch and just kind of chopping it down one branch after another, like three hours a day, day after day, because it grew very quickly. The branches went over the fence, over the wall. That's the picture it's giving you, okay? And what it's saying is Joseph has a difficult situation, but somehow Joseph finds a way to get over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. Now, does verse 23 look kind of dangerous? You got people shooting at you? Imagine climbing a wall and people are shooting at you. It's hard enough to climb a wall in general, and if people are shooting at you, there's dangers. There's difficulties because you're trying to climb a wall, and there's dangers because people are trying to kill you. Okay? Verse 24, But his bow abode in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And so what's said about Joseph is he was branches over the wall. And this is a verse that should be kind of a life verse for us as Christians. That you know what? In the Christian life, there are going to be difficulties. You must find a way to serve God anyway. Amen. Okay. Now, let me say this, because there are people at our church that are just not able to come to church right now. And I do believe as this is a real virus. There are dangers out there. And I'm not saying, hey, you have to, to be out here soul winning as much as you have before. That's not what I'm trying to say here. Okay. Because I want you to understand that. For one, we're all in different situations and there's a lot of unknowns. And look, at this time, if I wasn't able to go door to door soul winning, I would probably try to focus on old friends of mine from Facebook, old coworkers, old college people that I, I, I went to school with or whatever, because right now they are in fear. Right. And when you're afraid, you're more receptive to the gospel. So I'll tell you what, you know, if I was in this situation or if let's say 10 years from now, I'm in a situation I can't leave my house for months. That's probably what I would try to focus on because I would want to try to preach the gospel to someone. And look, there's going to be difficulties. And look, that's what I would suggest to anybody at this church or anyone listening that, hey, if you're not able to go, I understand it. It's a difficult time. There's a lot of unknowns. We don't know what's going to happen here in a couple of weeks. Man, try to focus on some of your, your old friends from college or whatever that you haven't talked to in years. Okay? Because even though they thought you're crazy for the last couple of years, now they're like, oh, man. You know, now they want to message you and say, what's going on? What does the Bible say about the end times? That's what they're thinking right now. I remember I, it was the end of my sophomore year of college and I got saved my freshman year. And it was the end of my sophomore year and I, it, I had a couple weeks left in the semester. And I was thinking, man, I want to try to get people saved that I know, you know, because I was going soul winning all the time, but I wanted to focus on people I knew. So I sent out messages. Facebook was new at the time. And I sent out um, messages to like 10 different people on Facebook and said, hey, I want to talk to you about the Bible, talk to you about the gospel and going to heaven. And four out of ten were willing to meet with me to talk about. It. The other six were not interested or they're busy or whatever. Out of those four, one person got saved. Okay. Now, one person was like an agnostic or atheist and he just blasphemed the Bible. And I ran into him several years later going soul winning and he still blasphemed. I'm sure he's a reprobate. He really hated my message. One was my old Mormon friend from high school and he did not get saved. And, um, but I did have one person I went to school with and it was funny because this person, I remember a couple years ago, I remember him like kind of mocking the Bible cause I knew him back in high school and he just had no interest. And it was someone I kind of knew I'd met a lot of times and I figured I'd give it a shot. And for whatever reason, his place in life, he was actually interested at that point and he ended up getting saved. And right now there are a lot of your family members that are Catholics that might actually be interested in this message. There are a lot of friends and family members that right now is the time to reach them because they're not sure what's going to happen. They have some fears. So look, I would use the opportunity right now, even if, you're not, even if you are going soul winning, right now this might be the opportunity to get people saved that you have not been able to get saved. Okay, right now is a great time. And look, there are going to be difficulties in serving God during the end times, like there's difficulties now. You must find a way to be the branches over the wall. Okay? Turn back in your the Bible to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. So look, there's going to be dangers during the end times, like there's dangers now. But what's worse, because I believe God's going to protect us, is difficulties. Because at the end of the day, I have to get groceries, and it's going to take three hours. It's like, I trust in God that, you know what, God can protect you when you're trying to serve Him. But you know what? There's certain things we must be getting done. And unfortunately, 
you know, getting groceries takes three hours, okay? And, and I've, I've still been, I'm blessed to say I'm still able to work during this time period, but when I'm spending all this extra time doing groceries, I'm like, man, it does not give me as much time to, to do my, um, you know, work for Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento. So it's like difficult times, okay? And so look, there are difficulties, and difficulties are worse than dangers as a believer. But do you know what's worse than dangers or difficulties for a believer? What's worse is distractions. Distractions are worse than dangers and difficulties because I believe God's going to protect us in dangerous situations. And you know, difficulties, you know what, it's not fun, but we're just going to find a way to get it done. But you know, honestly, so many Christians right now are so distracted by the news media and the coronavirus that they wake up at 8 in the morning and before they know it, they have not read their Bibles and it's 8 p.m. at night. The distractions are worse. And you know what? During the end times, there are going to be so many distractions from serving God. I'll prove it to you. Matthew 24, verse 4. Matthew 24, verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. The Bible says there are going to be people coming saying, I'm Christ, okay? And look, this is going to take place before the abomination of desolation. And even afterwards, there's going to be false prophets because people don't know what's going to happen during the end times. They're going to be confused. They're going to be like, man, why didn't the Lord already come back? I thought, I thought the preacher of rapture was true. And they don't know what's going on. And they're going to be deceived by all these things. These are kind of apostate Christians. They're not going to know what's going on. But look, when it comes to people saying, I'm Christ, you know what that is? That's something you're hearing that's distracting you. You're going to say, man, this person says he's Christ here and it's all over the news. All this stuff rising up. It's a big distraction. Verse 6, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Think about rumors of wars. Did you know on the news during the end times, all they're going to talk about is this country might go to war with this country. That's what you're going to hear. Rumor after rumor after rumor. And that's all the news is going to say. And they will distract you for hours and hours and hours and hours if you let yourself just pay attention to the news. That's what they're going to say. You're going to hear rumor after rumor after rumor. Oh man, the U.S. might go to war with Iran. Oh man, they might go to war with Iraq. Oh man, Israel might be bombed. It's like every single day. And that's what happens now, but even more so during the end times. Look, if you grew up in the U.S. and you ever watched Fox News or CNN, they just put you in a state of fear all the time. Like, oh man, you know, this country might have a nuclear weapon. They might destroy the world tomorrow. And literally, year after year, you're just put in a state of fear by the news. They have a goal. That's their purpose. They're trying to get you to watch. They want you to be dependent on the government. And that is their goal. And guess what? Christians get distracted with that. They get sucked in. And all they do is pay attention to the news all the time. That is just basically deceiving them and lying to them. They're distracted. Rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. Look, there is one virus right now, and 95% of what people are talking about in the world is what? The coronavirus. That's all anybody's talking about. I mean, nobody even talks about sports or entertainment anymore. It's all about the coronavirus. What do you think is going to happen during the end times? All people are going to talk about is this virus and that virus. Oh man, I heard this country might go to war with this country. Oh man, there's famines. And everybody's going to be extremely distracted. Right, right now, Christians are distracted. Right now, Christians are not working. A lot of them, they're not working at all and they're not reading the Bible. How is it that you aren't working and you don't have time to read the Bible? Because you're distracted by the news media. And let me tell you something. I don't think the end times is coming during our life, in my opinion. But I want you to see there's a correlation from what's happening now and during the end times. Because during the end times, everybody is going to be distracted by the things of the world. And that ties into not being a worldly person as we're going to talk about in the next sermon. Don't get distracted by the things of the world. I'm not saying you can't read anything or any reports, but look, if you get to your end of your day and you haven't read your Bible, you didn't pray, you didn't memorize the Bible, but you spent eight hours just watching things about the coronavirus, you are distracted in a worldly person. You're focused on the things of the world instead of the things of God. 
And right now, many Christians have all the time in the world, and it's probably going to be the same way during the end times. There's going to be a mass quarantining all the time in the world, and instead of actually reading the Bible and focusing on the things of God, they're just going to focus on the things of the world. Distractions are worse than dangers and difficulties as believers. Because look, you know, believers should all have the time to spend some time reading the Bible every day and memorizing the Bible. But the reason why Christians don't do that is they're so distracted with the things of the world. And people seem to think that the news, well, I'm not, you know, doing anything sinful. I'm just watching the news. Look, if the news distracts you from reading the Bible, then it's very sinful for you, my friend. If it distracts you from memorizing the Bible and reading the Bible and spending time with God and serving God, you know what? It's stopping you from serving God. That makes you a worldly person. And look, you're distracted by the things of the world. During this time period, make sure you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do in the morning is, guess what? You read the Bible and you pray. You don't say, oh, I wonder what's going on with the government. I wonder what's going on with the news. Look, that can wait a couple hours. Your personal time with God cannot wait, though. That should always be the first thing in the morning. You renew your mind daily. Amen. The Bible says all these are the beginning of sorrows. Okay, It's going to be like this the first three and a half years. Then once the abomination of desolation takes place, then we're going to know it's the end. Okay, And look, I, I want you to realize that when the abomination of desolation takes place, I believe there's 75 days left to serve God. Okay, And I hope during that time every Christian says, I'm just going all out to serve God. But I want you to realize that there's three and a half years before that where there's so many distractions and you could be serving God or you could just try to find out everything that's happening in the world. And look, the Bible says you're really not going to know until the abomination of desolation takes place, until he reveals himself to be the Antichrist. So don't focus and worry, oh, the end's going to come. Look, just serve God and read the Bible. Don't be so distracted with the things of the world. Turn to Deuteronomy 17. Deuteronomy 17. So look, are there dangers right now in our world? I do believe there's dangers. We've got an unknown virus. We don't really know how deadly it is. The case fatality rate is anywhere between a half percent to 15 percent, depending on who you ask. There's, we don't really know. There's confusion. We don't know what's going to take place. Is it going to just kind of die off? Nobody really knows. Look, I believe there's a danger out there. Okay, there's an unknown. There's dangers. There's going to be dangers during the end times. Are there difficulties now? Yeah, it's difficult with quarantining. And you can't even get your groceries. You're not allowed out of the house. In certain areas, they give you like this day, you're allowed to leave your house to get groceries. But the rest of the week, You'll be like arrested, supposedly, if you leave. Yeah, there's difficulties in serving God right now. There's difficulties in just getting your daily food right now. Okay? During the end times, there's going to be difficulties, my friend. And guess what? Are there distractions right now? Yeah. One virus is distracting the world from doing anything productive. During the end times, there's going to be a lot more than one virus. There's going to be at least two pestilences, because it's plural. And there's going to be rumors of wars actual wars, earthquakes, and that's kind of just giving you a highlight of a few of the things. There's probably going to be a lot more than that, okay? And if you're distracted right now from serving God, and you're not reading the Bible right now, guess what? You need to change something, because during the end times, you're going to be distracted. In those three and a half years, you're going to do nothing productive. Okay. Notice what it says in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. Let's see the, the, the reason given, a logical reason not to read your Bible during the day. Deuteronomy 17, we'll see what the Bible says. Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. And it shall be, when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law and a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. See, the Bible says, read therein all the days of your life. Is there an exception given there? Read all the days of your life unless there's some deadly virus. Read all the days of your life unless there's a volcano that exploded like hours away from you. <laughs> Read the Bible every day unless there's something more interesting on the news. Where's there an exception? Read every day. Right. And look, if, if I were to assume what God's thinking, I believe even if you were thrown in prison for more than 24 hours, God would expect you to meditate on God's word every day. Amen. Every single day you need personal time with God because it's your spiritual food. Look, if I went just a few days without drinking water, I'd probably die. If I went weeks without eating food, I could die. Okay, I know you can go weeks without eating food, but not everyone can, quite honestly, you know, depending on your condition and everything. Look, if you go without eating your spiritual, getting your spiritual food, you will spiritually die. You won't lose your salvation, but you're going to be what James 2 says is a dead Christian, right. which means you produce nothing. 
okay? And if you're not reading the Bible and renewing your mind on a daily basis, you're going to just die out spiritually and not serve God. You must be reading the Bible every day, no matter what the distraction, no matter the danger, no matter the difficulties, no matter the distractions. And let me tell you something, we are not restricted from having Bibles in this country. Amen. And so it doesn't matter if there's the most massive war in our country and the biggest difficulties and the biggest distractions to get, look, you should still wake up in the morning and spend your time with God and say, you know what, I'll trust in God that if I put him first, all these other things he'll give me, Amen. as the Bible says. That he may learn. Why? That he may learn to fear the Lord as God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. See, reading the Bible actually causes you to fear God and to keep his statutes. That his heart be not lifted up above his brethren. Being lifted up means you're prideful. Prideful people don't read the Bible. That's what it's teaching you. If you read the Bible, it brings you back down to earth, doesn't it? It humbles you and makes you realize, man, I'm, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And, you know, God, be merciful to me, right? Even after salvation, you confess your sins on a daily basis, hopefully. And reading the Bible, man, it makes you feel guilty. It's like it's sharper than any two-edged sword, my friend. It pierces you, doesn't it? That's what the Bible does. And that he turn not aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, to the end that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Turn to Daniel 6. Daniel 6. Daniel chapter 6. Look, as I've stated many times in the sermon, I, I don't want people to get the wrong idea. That's why I had a long introduction. Right now, there's people at our church that cannot come to church right now. Okay? It just is what it is. And, you know, people are in different situations, and it's not easy. It's hard. And look, since I believe this is a real virus, look, the reality is that, you know, my wife's not coming soul winning today. And, you know, my parents right now, they're self-quarantining themselves. Okay, even though their area is not a, a big outbreak, since I believe it's a real virus and, you know, my parents are both retired, you know, they're, they're more at risk. And so, look, if I was in their situation and people at our church, you know, I'd suggest being careful. Okay? But I want you to realize... There's going to be dangers during the end times too. There's going to be difficulties. There's going to be distractions. Notice what it says in Daniel 6 verse 9. Daniel 6 verse 9. This is a famous chapter of Daniel in the lion's den where basically the king says, you know what, you can't pray to any god. Okay? Verse 9. Wherefore King Darius, or Darius, signed the writing and the decree. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so he finds out, okay, I'm not allowed to pray to God anymore. He went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. And so Daniel is not trying to basically cause a problem with the government. Because it says, as he did aforetime. This is what he did. It says his windows were open. And look, probably where he lived, it's like in a big city. Sometimes houses are right beside each other. And you can see in somebody's window. It's just the way it is with houses packed beside. So he's not intentionally just saying, I'm going to basically prove a point. Because there's no purpose to do that. There's right. no purpose to fight the government, okay? There's no purpose to try to start a war with the government, okay? But Daniel says, I'm, I'm not going to stop praying, though. Amen. That's something that's part of my daily routine. He says, I'm going to keep praying. Well, notice what happens. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. They were trying to get Daniel in trouble, and the only thing they knew they could do is they could catch him praying. Does Daniel have dangers? Absolutely. <laughs> Does he have difficulties? Absolutely. Does he have distractions? Absolutely. Does it stop him? No, it doesn't. He just keeps serving God. And look, everyone in this room and everyone at a church who's watching, or anybody who's not at a church who's watching, look, during this time period, you should still be serving God. And that might mean looking up old Facebook friends to try to preach the gospel to them. I understand if you're not able to go soul winning. I understand if depending on what your government's decided and the restrictions and the dangers involved, but you know, find another way to do it. Find another way to serve God. Find another way to go soul winning during this time if you're not able to go door to door like you used to go. Start calling up your Catholic relatives and try to get them saved. You say, why? Because guess what? Distractions are part of life. Dangers, difficulties, and it's going to be more and more, I believe, until we do get to the end times. And during the beginning of sorrows, people are going to have to be creative to try to reach people with the gospel. I, I've been encouraged by some of the things I've heard from some of the other pastors that do have restrictions, and they've got creative ideas they're coming up with to preach the gospel. In my mind a couple weeks ago, 
think I was talking to a couple of the guys and I was trying to think in my head, okay, what ways can we come up with to preach the gospel as we have these restrictions, okay? Because we want to keep serving God and you know what? There are dangers, there are difficulties, and there are distractions. Turn to Acts 17. We'll close up here. Acts 17. Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. And you know, one of the things that makes this situation so difficult is, quite honestly, nobody can honestly just say, okay, this is how many people are going to die. Like, if we don't do any quarantining, this is the exact number of people that are going to die. Look, if, if I knew that only 200,000 people worldwide would die, which I think it's going to be a lot more than that, then I'd be like, okay, we have nothing to fear. I mean, that's, that's not really that many. Okay, but if you were to tell me it's 200 million, it's like, oh, wow, it's a big difference. Nobody really knows. Nobody really knows how effective the quarantining is. Look, they're, they're showing you those charts that this is what will happen, you know, if you do quarantining and it will go up and then go, and if you don't do quarantining, it's gonna be all the way up here. That's really just a guess. It's like, I haven't really seen hard numbers that would say this is the reason why, because it's, it's a very unknown situation, okay? And most of the people that are working on this, they've never dealt with this sort of virus where they don't really know. You listen to some people and they say it's this, this dangerous or this is how likely you are to die or this is how likely it is to spread. There's a lot of unknowns out there. And so look, people have different opinions because quite honestly, when it comes to a Bible discussion, you can just point to a verse and say, thus saith the Lord. Amen. When it comes to a discussion about the coronavirus, it's like, here's my opinion. And the reason why you have those opinions is there are these people that you trusted that you listened to that gave you that. Same with me. I have opinions and it's based on certain knowledge that I've acquired of people that I would trust to have the knowledge in that situation and the numbers I've looked at, but we honestly don't really know if those statistics are accurate. I, I think it's a real virus because when you, when you watch videos of the areas really affected in Italy or New York City, it's like there'd be a whole lot of nurses that would be lying if it wasn't really real. It sounds like it's pretty bad and a lot of people need help and stuff like that. But honestly, you know, we don't know fully how bad it is. No one really knows. So that's why there's unknowns and people have different opinions, which is why we need to be graceful with other pastors and churches that handle things differently. Or other Christians that feel differently about this matter. It's not the end of the world. We don't all have to agree exactly about this. Acts 17 verse 1. Now when they had passed through Ampho Amphipolis in Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in on to them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. And so Paul had a certain manner to serving God and to preaching the gospel. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Look, I'm thankful that during this time period, our church is still able to preach the gospel. We're still able to do some soul winning. And in our situation, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's fine for us as a church. A large reason why that convinces me is every single business right beside us is open right now. And it's just like, I think we have free reign to, to preach the gospel. We're using extra precautions. But you know, that's the decision we made. Now, some of you might look at the decisions we've made and said, you know what, I believe you're being watered down, Brother Stucky. It's like, why aren't we doing all day soul winning Saturday right now? Or why aren't we doing more soul winning on Saturday? Why aren't we doing Wednesday soul winning like a couple hours? And it's just like some of you might think the opposite. It's like, man, you guys are insane. Just shut it down for a couple months. And that's just the nature. Like, you know, we, we Brother Prince linked in the group chat, like Pastor Minnis made a great video basically about, you know, leaders making decisions and stuff like that. And look, the reality is that if I make decisions, there are going to be people that disagree with me. And I'm sure some of you in this room, you disagree and realize I had a lot of things I was factoring. Several weeks back, I was, I was considering, should we just shut down the soul winning for a couple weeks here? What's our situation? We had one service that was live stream only. For us, quite honestly, our live stream is just not going to be as good as some of the churches in the U.S., which is part of why we're still meeting, because quite honestly, it's just not the same quality as if you're here in person. Okay, and that's part of the decision. There's a lot of things to consider. Okay, and look, this is the decision we make. Okay, and look, you might disagree. You might say, I don't believe this is dangerous. I believe we're, or you might say the exact opposite. You know, that's fine. Okay, we just had to make a decision and we're going with it. As far as I know, everyone at our church is supporting it. We're fine with that. We're just trying to serve God the best we can during this time period. And look, I'm praying that the lockdown is going to end shortly. Amen. Amen. I hope it's not extended. Amen. Okay, I hope they decide because honestly, in this country, I believe in general, people need to work. They can't, there's a, the doctor in San Francisco. Some of you guys might have watched it. Like I, I watched it yesterday, and he was suggesting we extend the lockdown two or three more months. 
And it's like, well, it's easy when you're a doctor that you don't have to worry about your job and you live in San Francisco and you make like $250,000 a year. It's easy to say, well, you should just shut it down for just like several months. And it's like, what happens at the end of those couple months when they say, oh, we need a few more months. And look, our government might decide to do that. And we're not going to fight against the government if they decide to make that decision. You know, we're going to uh, uh, abide by what they say. We're not going to try to cause any problems. Our mission at Verity Baptist Church Manila is not to take over the government. I'm not going to run for president one day, okay? That's not my goal. I'm not going to run for senator or mayor. I'm not saying that it's a sin to do that. If you want to do that, you know, go ahead. If you have the beliefs we have, I don't think you'll get elected, but you know, you can go for it if you want. But look, our, our, we're not trying to cause any problems with the government. I'm happy that we live in a country where we can freely preach the gospel. There's really not much persecution as long as we don't start a fight with the government. Sometimes it's not wise to be more hardcore just for the purpose of being hardcore. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, the Bible says. That's what we're going to do. So I personally, I am praying that the lockdown will end as they said it did right after Easter time. But I will say that, you know, I read lots of things in the news that said they're, they're suggesting we extend it just a few more weeks and the government's not in a rush to, to lock it down or to end the lockdown and that might end up happening. It might be extended and it is what it is. But the point of this sermon is to let you know this, that, you know, quite honestly, there are dangers right now, I believe. There are going to be dangers during the beginning of sorrows as well. There are certainly difficulties right now. That's something I just didn't really think about, honestly, until these past couple weeks. But during the beginning of sorrows, there are going to be difficulties just living your basic life. But you know, even more so, which is worse, are the distractions. Do not let the distractions of this world stop you from serving God. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for allowing us to be here today, and I ask you to help us apply this sermon to our lives, and I, I just pray people will understand the spirit of which I was trying to deliver the sermon. I hope no one would get the wrong idea. I don't believe we should stand in judgment of any church or any pastor that's doing things a certain way. So a lot of decisions. We're not all in the same situation. The Bible says not to compare one another. Help none of us at church have this attitude or look down on some church members who have a different view. Obviously, we're not exactly sure what's happening or what's going to happen. And, you know, hopefully, you know, we can look back just in a couple months and this is, has worn out. And we just pray, God, that you'll help end this virus. Give us a chance to preach the gospel and freely go out and win souls to the Lord, God. And just, um, just continue to bless our church. And we just pray regarding the lockdown. We would pray if it would be your will to remove this lockdown soon, God. And people can go back to work and serving you and coming to church and going soul winning, God. But we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.